here with Agogi Fitness Systems and Mental Meatheads, uh, bringing you another one of our Wednesday interviews. Um, today I've got on the line uh, James Smith. Uh, he, you probably know him from uh, uh, Animal Ability, uh, and I'm discovering uh, he's very active on several different groups on Facebook. Um, he's got a, a very interesting and definitely a very mental meatheads approach to uh, uh, to his training uh, and to fitness. And so without further ado, James, say hey to everybody. How you doing? Great to be here. Cool, cool. Um, tell everybody a little bit about your background. Tell us, um, you know, before we started the interview, we were talking about that you had uh, uh, originally started uh, uh, in Virginia, but uh, give us a little bit of information about you, where you come from, and uh, um, where you are now, and we'll go from there. Okay. Well, I was born in Yorktown, Virginia, and grew up there right in York County, and uh, after a whole bunch of different things, I ended up working at the YMCA and did that for a few years, uh, close to five and a half, I think. And then I actually was going to open a gym with some friends. And while they were prepping that and everything, because they were going to finance it and all that, I was working this job, just a temporary job in a warehouse, and I got a concussion. So... When I went to the hospital, I found out that I had had to have, well, they thought I was hemorrhaging, but I wasn't. But I had an AVM, which was something that they could not do surgery on in Virginia back then. But it, it's one of those things that if you don't do surgery, you end up dying. They find yeah. it on an autopsy. So luckily, I did get the concussion because otherwise they never would have found it. And I ended up having to do a fundraisers and things like that. Uh, all my friends came together and raised money for the surgery, and I went to New York and, and got the surgery. It actually was two, and then when I came back, I, I was unable to work for about a year, you know, which was killing me, uh, basically because I wasn't able to work out neither, <laughs> yeah. you know, and uh, then I worked in the medical field, actually, for six years after that as a dialysis technician. That's uh, mm -hmm. people with kidney failure. And then I finally got back into my love of, you know, personal training people because I had been working out the whole time, you know, uh, ever since I started way back at the Y, except for that one break that I had to take. And then I opened up my own uh, gym bodies personal fitness training in, out of my home in Yorktown and did that for, I mean, up until the end of 2005. And then we decided to move uh, just about 30 minutes away. It was across the bridge over to another area of Virginia called Gloucester. And we bought a health food store. It was an existing health food store, and we bought it. And my wife was still working her job. So, you know, I switched professions, and I started running that. And, of course, I was still offering personal training to anybody who wanted it. And I put all kinds of tips out there and everything for that, you know, and then my my wife got a job offer here in Hawaii, so I said, "Hey, we're loading up the truck and moving to Beverly or Hawaii." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right on, right on. Um, so from from following you on Animal Ability and and seeing the posts that you put up and and seeing that the posts that you're sharing with uh, uh, with mental meatheads, um, you have a very um, natural approach to your training I think is is what I would call it um, it's uh, uh, I, I think in a lot of ways primal and 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 those type of terms are ever used I think a natural is probably a little more appropriate um, talk to us about how that came about and how you sort of developed your style and 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 tell us a little bit about your style elaborate on on my descriptions okay well, I mean, basically, you know, when I started out training, um, everything was bodybuilding style, mm -hmm. you know, split body parts and things like that, you know, different days for, you know, chest and buys or whatever, you know. Well, once I got into training, you know, as a personal fitness trainer from my home, I decided that I would go on the computer, which was new for me back then, 
you know, um, as you could see from our little pre-episode that I'm <laughs> definitely not an expert now, but uh, but I started looking up, um, you know, natural ways to train, you know, natural ways to, you know, and I discovered dinosaur training by Brooks Kubik. Yeah. You know, um, and I also happened to stumble on the Paleolithic diet. Now, mm -hmm. this was way back before CrossFit or any of that stuff had made it popular. Um, and actually, I was uh, corresponding with this guy who was in med school. He's a doctor now. But, uh, and he was giving me information. He was, it was his site that I found, and he had like uh, primal ways to work out um, and his uh, paleolithic diet. Well, I just I overloaded him with questions. I mean, it, every day it was something else. And slowly from there, I just developed, you know, methods of doing things that to me seemed like they were, you know, what you would do in nature. Mm -hmm. You know, so, um, you know, basically I was, I was, I've been constantly tweaking my diet over the years. And of course, ending up, owning a health food store that gave me access to tons of knowledge, you know, from the direct suppliers and all that, the wholesalers. So I was able to get a, a lot of information that way about, you know, proper eating and stuff like that. And, and if certain things didn't make sense to me, you know, I always question them, you know, cause I'm not just, I'm not just going to follow what somebody says. I'm going to say, well, why this, why that, you know, whether it's working out or nutrition or anything, you know. So basically, you know, I went from there and came up with my method that I use now. Of course, it's still evolving, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, talk to us a little bit. Uh, uh, talk to us, well, first of all, about that method. Um, you know, Tell us a little bit about your training. How, what does it center around? What is what? What do you consider your core components to your training philosophy? Well, basically, I try to do um, a holistic approach. So I try to include a little bit of everything, as long as it's you know natural or or could be considered natural, you know, in, in the society we live in now, mm -hmm. and. So there's a lot of gymnastic element, Olympic lifts, because, you know, theoretically they're the most athletic lift. Yeah. You know, so I've really been working on that. I corresponded way back when I lived in Virginia, actually sent the old VHS tapes to Dan John. Oh, wow, you know, cool. And he would critique them, and he would come on to Animal Ability, and, you know, I told him, I said, you don't have to email it to me, the answer's. Just put it out there for everybody to see. Tell me what I'm doing wrong. Tell me what I can work on and all that. So he did that. He was a big, big help. Uh, nice. Scott Sonin, I went to, I met him when I went to the a Wake Forest uh, Strength Clinic. Um, the guy who ran that, oh, what's his name? He's, he's well known. I know you'd know him. Um, can't. It's, it's on the tip of my tongue and I can't remember his name right now. But, uh, he did a great seminar, and he had uh, Scott Sonin and a bunch of other names. Coach Davies was there, you know, way back. And this is when they were kind of starting out, too. Yeah, yeah. You know, making their business. So I learned a lot from, from there, uh, validated a lot of stuff I was already doing, you know. So that, you know, that felt good that it was validated. And basically, you know, I, I keep trying to add more and more different conditioning techniques that aren't long, slow distance cardio. You know, I try to do uh, the interval training. Now, I was mistakenly calling it Tabata, but after uh, a long discussion with Matt Wiggins, you know, even though I was using the Tabata time tempo where you go 20 seconds mm -hmm. on and 10 seconds rest. The exercise choices weren't what could truly be considered Tabata by the original protocols by the Japanese Dr. Izumi Tabata who came up with it. Mm -hmm. You know, 
so basically I started calling it tempo training but it's basically the same thing a lot of times I'll do you know just four minutes of super fast super hard you know intervals tempos and even though I don't call it Tabata it sure feels like my lungs are about to explode you know <laughs> while I'm doing it but I, I throw in other stuff I throw in a lot of uh, grip work and things like that and neck on those days because I want to I have like a Monday Wednesday Friday are what I call conditioning days you know, so those are the days when I do more of the interval work and then the, uh, like, club work and mm -hmm. neck work and grip work. You know, club is a lot of grip, so, you know, I do that. And then the Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday are more strength-oriented with explosive, grinding, that type of thing, you know. And every after every single training I do my gravity pose stretches. And, you know, that's from yogabodynaturals.com. Um, but it's basically using gravity in, in poses that are conducive to that and just trying to relax as much as you can and sink deeper into the stretch as you do it. I mean, I find for me, I'm not the most flexible guy out there. Mm -hmm. so, but for me, it helps maintain my level of flexibility and it eliminates and prevents injuries. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll tell you a little story. When we moved here, you know, we shipped everything, all our furniture, weights, everything, you know, because I was determined, I was demanding that my weights had to come, you know, or at least I, I bought about, a, brought about a third of my stuff, but, you know, I brought the essentials. Yeah. And, you know, they ship in the big cargo container. So we were waiting for a couple of months. I had to like make do with what I had, you know, i actually pack some ropes and use them to do my training while I was waiting for the equipment and stuff to arrive. But uh, being a cheapskate, you know, we and not knowing anybody, I didn't want to pay people to unload the tr truck. So I would get up in the morning. It was like two days I did this. And the third day I actually did all, all of it until I got to the point where it was – the objects were just physically impossible for one person to move them. But I unloaded, I worked out, unloaded the truck all day, and then I did my stretching. And that, that gravity pose method really saved my life. Because I can tell you, I, I, I broke off the tip of my tailbone when I was 16, and I had back trouble all the way till I was in my 30s. And I found a chiropractor who could get my sacrum back in place and all that and get me aligned. You know, but I was still, you know, every so often in tremendous pain, you know. And since I've been doing these gravity pose stretches for probably five years now, you know, it's minimal to no pain 100% of the time. Wow. You know, I wish, you know, I'm 50 years old now, so I wish that I had listened when people said to stretch when I was 20. Because, <laughs> you, know? you know, I would do like – little touch your toes a few times and, you know, yeah. after the workout, okay, done. You know, it just wasn't exciting to me, but you know, it's not exciting now, but I can see the benefits immensely. Yeah, absolutely. It takes pain sometimes to teach you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I wish I could call it to mind right now, but uh, uh, Bruce Lee and uh, uh, the Tao of Jeet Kune Do has uh, – uh, there's a quote in there about uh, uh, the. Uh, I, th I think he's speaking about warm-ups, but uh, uh, but definitely the wisdom of the older athlete versus the uh, uh, the foolhardiness of, of the younger one who you know ah oh, I'm good I'm good to go come on let's go as opposed to no I'm take a few minutes I'm gonna stretch I'm gonna warm up and get my body right so uh, I'm 41 so I, I'm I'm right there with you. Uh, Oh, warm ups, cool. warm ups are, are essential to you know to everything that I do, uh, and and taking time to maintain that flexibility is cool. I will. Uh, uh, that website you said was gravity. Yeah, yogabodynaturals.com. Yogabodynaturals.com. All right, I'm gonna check that out. That sounds cool. Um. 
cool. Um, I heard you say, and I and I saw that you're uh, uh, you're into clubs. Uh, that's cool. I'm into clubs too. I like the clubs. I like. Uh, uh, you're also. Uh, uh, are you the force behind Mace Bell Ma Mace Bell Maniacs uh, on no, Facebook? No. That's that's not no, you, that's... but. I see. You I, I know those guys. Probably. Yeah, yeah. So that's cool. Uh, um, that's uh, uh, that's an, yeah. Those those odd traditional objects. I think uh, are are something that uh, uh, that are they're largely missed by uh, uh, our mainstream fitness uh, that they just haven't quite caught on. Uh, it, it, it more, it, I think they've caught on kind of in sort of a gimmicky sense, but I don't know that necessarily you know that they are as appreciated as as they could be in terms of uh, um, their utility and their versatility. I know you know oh, when yeah. I travel. I, when I travel, my wife jokes with me, but uh, uh, you know, I'll throw one kettlebell and you know a set of clubs in the in the trunk, and I've got I've got my gym. You know, I could be gone for a week, and I'm still I'm good. I got everything that I need, me and those three pieces of equipment, and I can do whatever I want. Right, so, right. Yeah, cool. Um, talk to us about your diet a little bit. Um, you said that uh, uh, you're very uh, uh, influenced by paleo. Um, but uh, that you were, you had to try everything out for yourself. So, what is what is your version of paleo look like these days? Uh, let's see. Well, basically, you know, I, of course, you know, you don't eat you don't eat grains. I don't do dairy, even raw dairy. A lot of paleo people will let that in their diet, but uh, you know, for me, it's just unnecessary because I went so long thinking you know, that that wasn't allowed, so I, I just eliminated it. I mean, I used to be a, a pizza and candy person, you know, so yeah. big change, you know, um, meats, fruits, vegetables, uh, a lot of nuts, any anything, basically anything that can be eaten raw that's edible in its raw form and nutritious is paleo. And that's, that's kind of the philosophy I use. I mean, in theory, you could eat your meats raw. Of course, I'm going to cook them, you know. But um, I cook them rare. There you <laughs> so, go. Uh, you know, that and just, you know, lots and lots of raw veggies. You know, especially, I, I like, uh, I have a, a salad I make. I, you know, it's just basically, you know, baby romaine, spinach, spinach kale, Red leaf, green leaf, lettuces, all mixed up, and then I use a uh, nutritional yeast, which yeah. gives you that cheesy flavor. Yeah. And I uh, I use hemp seeds, shelled hemp seeds. I put a uh, this stuff called uh, coconut and aminos on there. It's from Coconut mm -hmm. Secret, and it kind of is like a similar to a soy sauce type thing because soy is not paleo. So, um. I put that on there. I put olive oil. I put, you know, apple cider vinegar. And lately, I've been throwing some balsamic vinegar on there. And it is just, I mean, it, you feel like you've eaten a meal after just eating the salad. Of course, I still eat my meat. And, and you know, I have a, a secret treat I make, you know, that's all, all raw or most of it, about 90% raw, I would guess, you know, that's all paleo ingredients. Nice. Cool. Cool. Um, you mentioned before the break uh, that you've got two boys uh, swiftly moving into the teenage years. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> do, uh, uh, so is there any conflict there? Do they do they follow you in dad's footsteps? or uh, uh, you know, they, 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 Dude, they i got to go much, get a pizza. They pretty much were raised up paleo because mm -hmm. I started the paleo diet when my wife was pregnant with our first son. Now, since I started it then, she was, you know, she was just eating a regular diet and all that. My second son, she was eating paleo, you know, in her pregnancy with him. But, um, yeah, the one who's about to turn 11, um, he's working out with me. I take him through workouts. And nice. the 14-year-old is still working out, you know, on his own kind of. You know, he's... Yeah. 
he doesn't like me to watch him because, you know, being a trainer, I expect everything to be perfect, and, you know, when it's not, <laughs> I'm going to say something. Yeah. He, yeah. he didn't like that. My, my youngest can deal with it, you know, basically because he didn't know enough to uh, yeah. go against me. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Uh, my uh, uh, I've got three daughters. Um my my oldest is is too cool for school. She's a junior in high school now. She's she's doing her own thing. Um, the younger two uh, uh, train with me uh, two days a week, and uh, um, the the eleven year old is is the most compliant. You know, she whatever we, whatever you want to do, Dad, we're there. You know, the thirteen year old is like, oh, are we gonna lift today? I don't want to lift. <laughs> Let's just box. Why do why you know why do we have to lift? I'm like lifting is first. We always lift first, and then you can get the box. But you got to lift first. Uh, uh, so that's funny. I appreciate that. So um, you do boxing? Yeah, yeah. I do. A, uh, I do a kickboxing uh, uh, um, conditioning type class twice a week, and uh, um, and I sort of mix in elements of that with. Uh, um, so for my daughters. Um, they they come train with me at the gym two days a week, um, and so we cool. do, you know, we hit one major lift. Um, so if it's it's Monday, we're gonna deadlift, and if it's uh, uh, Wednesday, we're gonna do some sort of press, and then the remainder of the time is doing uh, uh, a circuit based training with focus mitts, and uh, uh, um, I've got a, 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 a they're neither one of them are are, are really adept at the jump rope, so I have a, a tire, and uh, I just, you know, use the tire as a mini tramp, and we'd bounce on the tire and do planks or, or bear crawls or, or any other sort of, you know, movement patterns, and I, you know, I keep the the, uh, the rounds, you know, 30 to 45 seconds and keeps them moving from station to station, um, just cool. stuff like that to keep them busy, keep them active, um, so, yeah, it, you know, my kids go to a Waldorf school, and even... You know, it's so it's a private school, and it definitely f appreciates movement. But even they're down to, I want to say they've got two movement classes a week now. So oh, wow. uh, uh, yeah, I, so it's just like you know, I mean, these are kids; they need to get out and move every single day. Um, but I mean, we had recess every day. Yeah. You know? Gym class every day. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think my teachers look forward to it as much as we did, just for you know, so that we go off and blow out some steam. I can't imagine, you know, having a classroom of kids inside all day every day. It just seems, you know, ridiculous. Um, you homeschool your kids. You want to talk about that a little bit? I think that's really interesting. Um, yeah, um, when we before we came here, we were buying our own curriculum and kind of putting it together ourselves. Mm -hmm. When we came here, uh, my wife found out about this K-12 program, which, which is, well, it's national, it's international, actually. And what it does is it has local affiliates, I guess you would call them, not exactly sure, but they use the K-12 curriculum and, mm -hmm. and site as their guideline and, and like I was saying, it's Hawaii Technology Academy is the one in Hawaii that does that. So it's even though it's called Technology Academy, it's not like a, a tech school. It's actual, you know, reading, writing, arithmetic, you know, whole nine yard, every course you can think of. It's uh, meets and exceeds the uh, standards for education, Department of Education. Uh, and basically, they will provide computers if your children don't have none. Now this year, our, my children have their own laptops because my wife insisted on getting them their own laptops so they wouldn't be without them for the summer because they have to turn their computers back in at the end of the year and then yeah. get them next year. Well, they're so into the video games and stuff, you know, that's driving me nuts. But, you know, <laughs> um, they're into that. And But they uh, actually provide computers and you do like a, a rental or whatever you pay a fee but that's redeemable at the end of the year if you didn't damage it they get computers they do it at home there's learning centers that they actually can go to 
last year was the first year that the Big Island had a learning center activities for the kids to go to because the main headquarters is on Oahu, which is where the capital is, Honolulu and everything. Mm -hmm. And that's where most people, when they think of Hawaii, they think of Honolulu, Hawaii Five-O, all that, you know. But this island is is larger than all the other islands combined, but it's more uh, more ranch based. When uh -huh. we first moved here, we moved to an area called Waimea, which uh, they for uh, mailing addresses they call it Kamuela, which is Hawaiian way of saying Samuel named after Samuel Parker. But um, we moved there, and that's where we started it. But it was actually, you know, built around a whole ranch. I mean, the whole place, everywhere you went, there was Parker Ranch this, Parker Ranch that, you huh. know. Now, it was actually higher elevation there, so we had gotten rid of most of our warm, our cold-weather clothing and just brought shorts and T-shirts. Big mistake because it got down to like 50 at night there, and I was like, "Oh my gosh!" Wow. <laughs> you know. So a year later, we moved over here to Waikoloa, you know, where it's it's a desert. I mean, you have to have water systems, you know. It's you know it's tropical looking and everything, but it's only because the water systems are out there. If it was wow. left to its own, it would be, you know, scrub, shrub and lava rock, you know, everywhere. But I, I love it here because I can have my workout stuff outside. You know, it seldom ever rains. You know, it's just great. I work out outside every day. You know, nice. I could do my uh, punch bob and whatever out there. And, you know, because I also do uh, combat stuff. I, I learned uh, knives and swords and sticks and unarmed when I was back in Virginia. And, I mean, I was with the guy for probably 15 years or so you know, doing that. So that that's part of my workout too is cool. everything I do is kind of geared towards making you better, a, a better warrior. You know, so you want to be able to defend your family and yourself, you know, against the quote unquote bad guys and whatever. So I just try to make sure that everything I do is revolves around that kind of mentality. You know, even if I'm out there doing pull-ups or something, I'm thinking, okay, I'm pulling up on top of a building to climb up, you know, I'm doing this and doing that, yeah. Excellent, excellent. Um, that school that you were at, was that a traditional school or uh, um, more of a, a, a mixed type school? The uh, martial arts? Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's called the two, School of Two Swords. And what it is, is Eastern and Western traditions blended together. Nice. So it's uh, the okay. guy. The guy writes all kinds of books, like he's doing a book on the gladiators right now, and uh, he he's on Facebook. His name's Dwight Mclemore. Okay. And he's kind of he's kind of new to uh, Facebook. He's actually from close to you, or kind of close to you. He's from Louisiana. Yeah. You know, I know you're in Alabama, right? That's right. Okay, it's pretty close, I guess. Same yeah. part of the country. Closer than Hawaii. Right. <laughs> but, uh, he, he's a great guy. I mean, he's just a, a, a font of knowledge. I mean, Excellent. he's he's a historian. He taught history. He's a, he's a retired lieutenant colonel from the Army. You know, he taught history. He's also an artist, so the pictures in his book, he's actually drawn them himself. Oh, nice. You know, cool. And they're oh. really neat. I mean, you know, all his books, he taught us – we first started, you know, he taught Japanese sword because that was where he started. But then we went through English long sword, Bowie knife, you know, uh, lots of everything. And everything uh, he did, he would show you the unarmed application. So no matter if you were doing Japanese or medieval English broadsword or colonial time Bowie knife or whatever, you know, he would show you the unarmed application of the things, you know, so it was really neat, you know, and nice. And we, we did, uh, we put on our gear and did full contact sparring with these padded, it's like a piece of PVC pipe with pipe insulation around it. 
and it looks, you know, it looks a lot like a knife. It's flat and everything, so you could be edge aware when you're, you know, so you're not just spanking somebody with a blade. You know, you're actually <laughs> cutting them if you had a real knife. You know, yeah. and uh, it's pretty neat. I did that for 15 years. Still talk to the guy all the time. Uh, still teach my boys, you know, everything I can remember that he taught me, and uh, it's great. Nice, nice. Yeah, I, I, I do have a, a, a share an appreciation for the martial arts and, and have a, a mixed and varied background um, and uh, um, towards towards the end of, of what I consider my, my heavy martial arts phase. Um, definitely got into some of the Kali and Arnie uh, stick fighting stuff and uh, uh, so I, I have a big appreciation for uh, uh, for that and uh, uh, a healthy fear of the edged weapon. That's uh, uh, that is not something you want to just play around with. So, oh yeah, yeah, very cool. That's awesome. Um, what's uh, uh, what's the overall culture like uh, as far as health and fitness where you are? I mean, we you know here in the mainland we we tend to, uh, uh, I think we sort of fantasize Hawaii is, is this land of, uh, uh, of health and paradise and, and, and richness. Uh, um, you know, are, are we mistaken or, is, or what's it really like? Mm, that's kind of hard to answer because in, in some respects, you know, it's just as sad as the rest of America when it comes to people's overall fitness in general. You know, and when you go to the beach, it's not, you know, hula girls and every, everywhere. You know, most of the time it's just people just like everywhere else, you know, overweight, out of shape people. You know, but there is, since they do the uh, Iron Man here mm -hmm. on this island, actually, there is a, a certain subculture of very fit people that are into it. You know, there's a lot of... Uh, gyms around here. There's a lot of shops selling all the Iron Man, you know, things you need and this and that. You know, so a lot of people are really into that. And any given day, I mean, you can go out, you can drive down to the low road, is what they call it, because it's down by the shoreline. And it's a long road. It circles the whole uh, 4,000 square mile island, just about. You know, and so it's not like driving a strip at a beach, you know, it's like you're actually riding and seeing, you know, lava rock, lava tubes, the Hawaiian graffiti, which they take because the rock is black, uh -huh. you know, they take these white stones and write out things or make different symbols and stuff like that, you know, so that's pretty neat to see. Um, there's a lot of different uh, ethnic groups and cultures that live here, so being being Caucasian, what they call Halle, um, you're you're definitely you know kind of a minority, you know. Yeah. Which you know, it doesn't bother me. I mean, I I fit in with everybody. I get along with you know everybody. You know. Halle is kind of an insult, isn't it? It's well, kind of like no, actually, Gaijin actually, in Japanese. It can be used as an insult, but most of the time it just means foreigner. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. You know? Um, I mean, you know, if somebody says, you effing Hallie, well, of course, yeah. that means it's an insult. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, if, if they're, uh, you know, somebody says, you know, Hallie this, or, like, like, oh, he's a he's a Hallie, you know, that Hallie guy. I mean, they're, yeah. they're just describing somebody, you know. It's, gotcha. Sometimes they'll say, uh, I heard one guy, because when I first came here, I had just started – with an MMA school in Virginia. So when I left, um, I was wanting to find something here. So I went down, I looked everywhere, and I finally found out about a place called the Polynesian Fight Club. So, you know, well, number one, when I went in there, you know, I was like the only, pretty much the only Hallie, except one other guy who looked Hallie, but you could not understand him because he was born here. He grew <laughs> up here. You know? And, you know, me with my southern accent, yeah. that didn't do well with the Hawaiian pigeon, you know. But, um, you know, so I went in there and I, I, I said, okay, to my wife, I said, Sheila, I want you to come in 
I want you to look and decide. I said, because I want to do this. I said, so tell me if it's okay, and I'll sign up. You know, she came in, and then she said, I need to talk to you outside because it's all these big Hawaiian guys. And I'm, you know, I'm small. I'm only like just shy of 5'9 and 155 pounds, you know, and all these freaking Hawaiian monsters are in there, you know. But I, I just wanted to learn some of the grappling and things like that yeah. that, you know, just so I'd know – when I was training, because sometimes I trained some MMA fighters, that I would be able to train them and give them get them strong in positions that they would need to be strong in to get out of some of these holds and things like that. But anyway, I went in there and she said, "Are you sure you want to, you know, fight with these guys? You know, they'll look like they'll eat you alive because they're all sitting there, you know, like that and everything." But they were the nicest group of people, you yeah. know. And I would hear them talking in there, and back to the Howley thing, sometimes they would say, you know, that guy, he's Japanese Howley. And I'm like, well, what does that mean? You know, is that is that just mean yeah. he's Japanese, and they're saying he's a Japanese Howley? What it meant, I, I think what it means, uh, you know, I asked around a lot, but they're speaking pigeon, so it's hard to figure, hard to decipher with my Virginia ears. Um, it's a person who's half Japanese, half Caucasian. Gotcha. So that, that's what that, that meant, you know, so that was kind of funny. But, I mean, yeah, great group of guys. Uh, we, when we moved, I, it was too far for me to drive. So yeah. And the school actually ended up closing down anyway just because of, you know, space and stuff like that. I think they opened it up under a different name now. I think that's uh, uh, one of the great uh, – ironies of of what we do both in terms of uh, um, you know it, it, both in the the strength world and in the uh, uh, the martial arts world that you know I mean it's it's certainly not always the case but nine times out of ten my experience has been that the the biggest burliest scariest looking dudes are usually the sweetest teddy bears that you know you ever have a chance to meet. Now, granted, you know if you know if you're going to go toe to toe with them on the mat, you know they will crush you. But when it's all over, you know they'll be like, "Hey, man, that was really good. You really pulled out some new stuff today. I was impressed by that." Or, you know, if you have questions, they're always you know always giving with their information. You know, they don't. There's no. And I think you know my own theory is is that when you uh, uh, when you truly test yourself, because um, you know my own martial arts experience actually started with Tai Chi. I started with Tai Chi 20 years ago, and and gradually worked my way into successively more and more aggressive styles. Um, finally, ending up in, in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, um, and and what I found is is that. Um, and like I said, I find the same thing in the powerlifting community. It's the guys who really train. There's no need for bluster. There's no need for ego. There's no need for for pretense or or, or fronting because they know exactly what they can do. And so right. you know, and that breeds a very strong, very real sense of humility. Um, and I think I think that's a beautiful thing. So you know, it's uh, uh, it's cool to hear you tell that. That's a cool story. Oh yeah, I mean those those guys. Uh, actually, uh, about five of them came to. Even though I was like the lowest man on the totem pole there, you know, when we were doing the drills, they were they were all like crawling towards the wall to sit, you know, because you do these rotational drills where one person would rotate in, mm -hmm. there'd be like three people on the ground and three people would rotate in, and then when uh, a person achieve the certain goal, whatever the goal of the drill was, you know, with the um, live sparring to reach that goal, as soon as the person got the goal, they got to stay, and then the person who got who lost would go out, and the next person in line would come in, and it would just keep going. It would rotate. Well, you know, I was, I was really knew nothing. So it's like I, I could never win those things, but I could – resist quite a bit and then still get up and be standing against the wall ready for my turn, you know, ready to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and all this. And these guys, they're like, you know, most of them are like half my age. 
you know, they're like over there collapsed against the wall, and they, they hadn't even been <laughs> fighting for half the time I was fighting. So I ended up actually training about five or six of them for conditioning, you know, and they would come over the house, and they would do different conditioning things. And that was part of my learning process, too, because, uh, you know, I was trying to learn the things that were going to help them and the mm -hmm. things that were going to, you know, maybe not so much that would have to change. You know, so that was a real good opportunity getting to train those guys. And actually, even the instructor came, and he was one of my diehards that came, you know, and trained for the longest time, you know, until I moved. They all trained. That's cool. That's a very cool thing. That's good to hear that. Um, so let's use this as a segue into uh, uh, into your passion. And uh, uh, clearly, uh, um, you are very passionate about what you do and uh, uh, and, and sharing your experience. Um, talk a bit about that. Talk about uh, uh, animal ability. Um, what uh, uh, what is what are your goals for your outreach? What is it that you're trying to achieve? Basically, I'm trying to spread the word about you know my method of nutrition and fitness. I mean, the whole spectrum. I'm just trying to get it out there to as many people as possible. I'm, you know, I don't care if it's free. I don't care if I'm making bunches of money off it. I don't care. I'm just putting it out there for people to see and do, and all this. Um. I'm sure you've probably seen the pure leverage links that are on some of my things I post. Mm -hmm. That would be where if somebody signed up for that, I would make money. But that's like an online uh, business tools like what we're using right now uh, thing. And I'm just a reseller because I'm definitely not – I don't really know how to use all the things, but I know what they are and I can explain to the person what they are. But basically, you know, I want to get out there that you, you can be fit – and super healthy, age has nothing to do with it, you know, because um, I, I believe things are a result of cumulative damage. You know, you were saying like the young guys don't really spend enough time warming up, and then as you get older, you realize the value. Well, the only reason you realize the value of it is because you've got so much cumulative damage to your tissues and structure by then that you need to do it. You know, your body is forcing you to do it. But you really needed to do it when you were younger. That's why yeah. I have my sons, you know, I say you got to do your mobility. You can't just go out there. I don't care if you feel like you can because you're doing micro trauma to your tissues and all that. So, you know, I want to get get across the, you know, that philosophy that, you know, that age is, is more a number and the symptoms that people are calling age are cumulative damage to your cells and tissues. You know, whether it's from poor nutrition, uh, poor posture, bad workout, you know, form, whatever it is, you're getting some type of trauma to your body. And if you can avoid that, and you can't avoid it all because you're a human and you're going to move around and you're going to have, you know, things happen to you or whatever, but... I also want to get through the philosophy of minimal effective dose. You know, that's where if you don't need to do 10 sets of something and you can get just as much results from five, why are you doing 10? Mm -hmm. if, if you can get the results from one, why are you doing five? Now, I'm not saying I never do 10 sets of something, but I'm just saying that you have to gauge it, and I, I wrote a little article about this, on the intensity level, which a good way to measure intensity is percentage of your perceived one rep max. You know, are you doing, you know, 90% of that for your work weight? Is, that, is your work weight 90%? Is your work weight only 60%? Well, of course, you can do more sets or more reps if it's a lower weight, you know and get away with it because it's not going to sap tap into your your recovery ability for your you know body or your nervous system because that's the big thing is a lot of people don't realize that even when they do something for low low reps and low sets if it's 95% of their one rep max you know even though they did it and they made it and they're not really you know 
inordinately sore the next day, but they feel tired, they feel drained. It's your nervous system. Mm -hmm. you know? So, I mean, you, you have to make sure that you calculate that in. And like with my workouts, like a typical strength workout, I always start with explosiveness training. Okay, well, that could be something like kneeling jumps where you get down and kneel on your shins and pop up to as, as close to a stand as you can, you know. And then I'll do, you know, while my nervous system is fired up from that, I'll do something, a heavy deadlift, you know, uh, heavy Olympic lifts. And then I'll try to finish up with some core things, you know, like uh, the Turkish get up with press you saw the other day. I finished up yeah. with that this morning, you know. And, uh, you know, that that's really good. But when I do that, I try to look at the workout and I say, not, you know, what, what do I need in here? You know, what am I missing, like, movements or section of the body-wise? And then once I put that all in, because I write down, I type down everything and got tons of charts, you know, once I get those workouts typed up, then I look at them again, like, every day of the week, because I type it up in advance, and I'm thinking, okay, what can I cut out without missing? Can I cut out, you know, like... If it says five rounds, well, what if I did three rounds? If I did three rounds, maybe I could do one more set of something else and be good, you know? Or am I going to feel? Or am I going to go ahead and do, you know, all five rounds and then do extra sets of the other and then be drained for a couple days? You know, I don't mm -hmm. really like that. They have uh, some neat ways to test you here in Hawaii because they have like these trails that zigzag up a cliff. So you're going from sea level to two or 3,000 feet in a matter of, well, it's how fast you are and, and, and skilled, you know, agile and stuff like that because you can walk slowly up it or you can just barrel up it and everything. And you can test yourself that way. You know, you can see... And I've done that a few times, you know, and I, I, I went with people that were used to doing it and hung with them or beat them on it. You know, not that it was a race or anything, but, you know, they were dying and I wasn't, mm -hmm. you know. And inside I was feeling good that I wasn't, you know. I was feeling bad for them, but, you know, <laughs> but they were suffering. But we had some people come visit us here, and they, they could, could not even make it. The, they said, okay, this is great. The view's awesome. We're looking out over the ocean and cliffs and rocks, and you know, there's another island there you can see. But we gotta go down. We can't take it. We gotta get in the car and drive. You know? <laughs> so, I mean, it's 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 awesome when you're you can prove what you're doing, validated at least to yourself. Yeah. That is valuable. You know, and that's the way I feel. You know, about my workouts. I want the minimal effective dose but I want to make sure it's effective. And the only way I can test if it's effective is to put myself in test situations where I've got to, where it's do it or die, you know, and then I see, you know, if I can do it, you know, cause I don't want to sit there and do the maximum, get an injury dose, you know, and make myself so sore. I can hardly walk the next day because that's sure as heck not going to be, you know, conducive to somebody jumping my family. And me being yeah. able to you know, hobble over there and try to get them, you know, just wouldn't work. You know, yeah. see everything's combat minded. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I get that. Uh, you know, I, I think you know, even even as somebody who is is, and, and I get the same feeling from you. I don't, I don't feel a, a, a real aggressive vibe for you. You seem to be a fairly peaceful guy, but it's uh, uh, a uh, uh, you don't want to be limited. In any way, right. you know, you want it. In a sense, it's it's a a, a manifestation of physical freedom. Um, that in any given moment, uh, sort of what Ori Hoffmeichler talked about in uh, uh, in his book, and uh, uh, this idea that uh, uh, you know you you don't want to be limited in any given moment. You ought to be able to respond to any situation given whatever might come. Um, and you're right. If you know, if you're trashed from you know a heavy deadlift session, you know from the previous day or, or two days prior, you know, and you're still limited in your abilities because of that, you know, 
for for some of us, that's that's an, a completely unappealing thing. Um, you know, there are other people out there whose whose pursuit of strength is is so strong that they're willing to sacrifice. You know, getting off the toilet for three days. That's fine. You know, I'll I'll, <laughs> I'll call for help if I need it. But uh, uh, you know, no, I appreciate what you're saying. That's uh, uh, and that's that's cool. We as as human animals. Um, we're designed to move, and we were given a brain to be able to choose how we want to do that and, and what's optimal for us. And uh, uh, I like your approach. I really do. I uh, um, My goal has always been to be the old guy in the gym. You know, I want to – I got a late start. I wasted a lot of time. And so uh, uh, if I am, you know – if I am 41 right now, then 30 years from now, I still want to be the guy that's in the gym that everybody else is doing. What's that guy doing here? You know, but uh, uh, I still want to be vital. And, and how come he's deadlifting more than me? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> how could he do that? Absolutely. Well, James, I really appreciate uh, uh, you taking the time with us today. Um, I've taken up about an hour of your time, and I don't want to. Uh, uh, to take advantage any further than that. Um, what I would like for you to do for us, though, is uh, uh, if anybody who is listening is more interested in, uh, uh, in you and your philosophies and would like to follow up, um, what, what are the best resources for, uh, uh, for them to look for? Of course, you know, I, I highly recommend the, uh, uh, the Animal Ability uh, group on Facebook, but are there any other things that you've got going on that they might be interested in? Um. I have a forum that I've had for way back. I, mean, I had this back when I first started. It's animalability.yuku.com. It's just a discussion board. Um, a lot of a lot of the same stuff though is is more current on the Animal Ability group on Facebook. So if they just type that in and and go there, there's also a like page, you know, that's available. It's called Animal Ability also. So those are the best ways. I mean, I check those multiple times a day. You know, I, I'm usually at my computer, you know, if I'm not out working out or, or helping the kids do something or taking them somewhere. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the best way to get in contact with me is through the Facebook groups. Cool. What's uh, uh, Give us the URL for your blog, too, because I know you blog pretty regularly. Oh, shoot, you had to ask me that. You know, I, I'll tell you, it's it's on the Animal Ability Group. Okay. If you look up the latest blog, that's where to get it because this is brand new. I just started blogging. Okay. You know, so I'm still, still trying to figure out the ins and outs of how to do it and make it look right and everything. It's a pure leverage blog. I'm using their tool, and they're giving me, you know, the ability to put out my articles and things like that. I'm, I'm trying to write – a at least an article a week is my goal. I'm already, I just published one, you know, yesterday, and I'm already on a, another one. So nice. I got a lot of Good. stuff to say, you know, and hopefully people want to listen. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, uh, you know, I, I joke about uh, uh, about fitness being a uh, uh, sort of like the new church. Um, and that uh, uh, those of us out there are uh, uh, are evangelicals for the cause. So uh, uh, to my fellow evangelical brother, man, I appreciate uh, uh, you spending the time with me today. And uh, uh, keep the faith, keep keep up the good fight. And uh, uh, I will uh, everybody any of those links uh, that uh, uh, that we mentioned, I will make sure that they're available uh, on. Uh, um, on the website when I post the article or, or the interview. And uh, uh, James, thank you very much. I appreciate you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Everybody, this is Dave Hall signing off for another week. Uh, don't forget, we are still signing up for Mental Meatheads 2, uh, which is going to be at the end of the month of September, September 21st and 22nd. Uh, Chip Conrad and Jason C. Brown will bring bringing you a whole lot more of, uh, of, of a lot of what we've been talking about today. So uh, take a look out for that. Links will be available for that as well. Uh, have a great week, everybody, and I'll see you next time.